And joining us now on the line from Claremont, California, Min Chin Pei, Director of the Keck Center for International and Strategic Studies at Claremont McKenna College. And it's good to have you back on the program, Min Chin Pei. We just interviewed your friend Ezra Vogel about the life of Deng Xiaoping, so that feels like a good place to start. China recently marked the 20th anniversary of Deng Xiaoping's historic tour of southern China, so why don't you start by telling us why that trip was so important? Oh, that trip was uh, historic in the sense that uh, after Tiananmen, China was in a funk politically and economically. Uh, people were very frustrated, angry, uh, and the economy was not growing very well. And then on top of that, the Soviet Union collapsed in December 1991. Deng Xiaoping himself was very worried. He saw China was going to slide back into chaos. Its economy was not going to develop and the Communist Party's future would be doomed. So he took a tour, a private tour of southern China. And along the way, he gave a set of speeches, which essentially said, if the current leadership does not want to reform, they should step aside. And that started China's uh, rapid economic growth. Let me read a quote of something you wrote in the Financial Times a couple of months ago. As China marks the 20th anniversary of Deng's history-changing tour, the most ironic fact, and perhaps China's worst kept secret, is that pro-market economic reform in China has been dead for some time. Evidence of the demise of economic reform is easy to spot. Okay, what would you point to? Let's start there. Oh, we, uh, we can look at many things. First of all, the overall direction of China's economic development is not toward more market, but toward more state control. You can look at this by uh, examining the, uh, uh, the share of state-owned enterprises in the economy. Over the last 10 years, the share has stayed roughly the same. Uh, they should have come down a lot. And also, uh, these state-owned enterprises uh, occupy very strategic sectors in the Chinese economy. Then you also look at China's relationship with its trading partners, because that's a very, very good indicator of whether China is moving toward more markets or more state control. In recent years, we've seen many, many disputes, and these disputes are intensifying. If you look at the core issues of these disputes, they all deal with the degree of state control in the Chinese economy. Would you say state capitalism is the most appropriate way to describe the governance model in China's economy today? Oh, yes. I think it, uh, it's uh, very close to state capitalism, but I might also add another word, crony capitalism. Because other than state capitalism, which means the state controls a great deal of capital, there is another phenomenon in China, is that private capital is in cahoots with political power. You have this unholy alliance between the rich and the powerful. And that's a recipe for crony capitalism, even though capitalists in this arrangement are private, not uh, state entities. I think I've actually seen you describe it not as crony capitalism, but crony competitivism, meaning communistic capitalism. Does that get at it too? Oh, yes, because when you look at the political structure, it actually uh, is not that different from a classical Leninist Communist Party, with one exception. The communists in uh, this political party are far more interested in making money for themselves hmm. than in pursuing some kind of utopian ideology. As you look back over the last 20 years, is there a single moment that you could point to where you would say, aha, that's where the real economic reform movement that Deng Xiaoping aimed at, that's where it ended? No, I could not identify a single event that would mark the death of Deng Xiaoping's reform. I would say that uh, the death occurred quietly and very gradually over the last 10 years. Uh, it was a series of very minor steps, uh, not by doing something, but not doing something. For example, delaying banking sector reform, delaying interest, uh, interest rate liberalization, uh, uh, failing to do land reform, failing to privatize state-owned enterprise. All of these things that amount to not doing something rather than doing something to kill the reform. And I guess many people thought when China joined the WTO, the World Trade Organization, 
that would help encourage even further reform, but it doesn't seem to have been the case. Why do you think not? Uh, several reasons, I think. Uh, first of all, the nego uh, China got a very good deal in the negotiations. China managed to protect all the key sectors from Western competition, and these sectors remain in the hands of the state. Uh, the other thing is that uh, once China joined the WTO, China's foreign trade grew tremendously, and China's growth rate accelerated, and that took off the pressure for economic reform. In China, when you look at its history, economic reform uh, accelerates only when there is a lot of external and internal pressure. In other words, crisis leads to reform, growth hampers reform. Hmm. Let me once again read an excerpt from a piece you wrote for the Financial Times earlier this year. One may be tempted, you write, to blame leadership failure for the premature demise of China's reform. While this is certainly a cause, a far more critical factor is more responsible. The Chinese Communist Party's political objective of reform is fundamentally incompatible with a market economy. As long as pro-market reforms are used as a means to preserve the political monopoly of the CCP, such reforms are doomed to fail. Now, the model that Deng Xiaoping created, where the party leads market-oriented reforms, has allowed communists to remain in charge for three decades. So why is there a reason to think that that just simply won't continue? Well, because if it continues, and if you apply the model of liberal capitalism to China, then you will ask the following questions. Will uh, ownership of assets remain in the state's hands or in the hands of private individuals? Uh, will there be a set of uh, rules and laws that constrain uh, that limit the power of the state and protect the rights of individuals. You ask all of these questions. Uh, then at, uh, at the end of this process, you will reach this stunning conclusion that if such a system exists, the Communist Party cannot survive because mm. its economic base, its political control will all have eroded as a result of building a genuinely market-oriented economy. Well, let me pluck an example that came out of the headlines just a few days ago. Uh, a train crash in China where uh, yes. many people died a as a result of uh, the bridge collapsing. And it later emerged that apparently things were done in a very shoddy fashion, and one of the subcontracts on the thing was given out because somebody was having an affair with somebody else, and the person in charge of the project wanted to steer some business to his mistress's company. All of the kinds of things frankly, that you see in, in happening in Western countries all the time. Uh, I guess China thought it could avoid well, this kind of with much less frequency. Capitalism. With much less frequency, okay. Why is this kind of thing still happening in China? Oh, well, as I say, it happens not just in uh, the realm of transportation. Uh, food safety is another issue. Environmental protection, another issue. Uh, building codes, another uh, problem. It just is systemic. Because once you give the people enormous, uh, uh, in power enormous discretion and no accountability and no monitoring by a free press, these people can abuse, misuse their power. And the result is uh, what you see in China, uh, all kinds of corruption and poor social services. Uh, that's why I think uh, China has this very ironic ph phenomenon. On the one hand, economic growth has been very high. Uh, people's uh, standards of living have been improving. But the resentment against the government, uh, uh, the, the amount of social unrest are also rising. And that actually shows the contradiction between crony capitalism on the one hand and a rapidly modernizing diverse society on the other. Well, let me ask you about a big political shakeup that took place in the Chinese Communist Party. I think just overnight, Bo Zhi Lai, party chief in Chongqing, has been fired amidst a police investigation about corruption. Uh, he was a controversial figure known for promoting, quote, a red revival campaign. What do you think his removal tells us about the Communist Party's stance on corruption these days? I think he was not removed for personal involvement in corruption per se, even though they may have something to do with it. I think he was removed for something far more serious. Uh, one, as you pointed out, uh, 
the means through which he gained national prominence is very controversial. Reviving uh, Maoist uh, ideology uh, can make people very nervous about his political intentions in the future. But I think more seriously for the Communist Party, it is his uh, right-hand man, the former police chief of his province, who tried to seek asylum in the U.S. consulate in Chengdu. And that is unprecedented. And that must have made the top leadership so angry, uh, not just with the police chief, but with the way the party sec secretary handled the whole matter. And Min Shin Pei, let me ask you one last thing in our last minute and a half here. Tell me why you firmly believe that with political liberalization, not just economic liberalization, but political liberalization in China as well, there will be less of this crony capitalism going forward. Yes, I think because with political liberalization, you're going to have all the kinds of tools, organized tools to deal with crony capitalism. The, a free press, a political competition, uh, these two ingredients and transparency, uh, these three ingredients uh, based on international experience are very effective in reducing crony capitalism. And do you think with the leadership change... It does not mean that with political liberalization... I'm sorry, with political liberalization, you're not necessarily going to get high economic growth, but you're going to get a lower level of crony capitalism. And in our last 30 seconds here, you know there's a leadership change coming, of course, in the next few months. Do you see anything changing with Xi Jinping in charge? Nobody knows. Uh, we certainly hope there will be change. Understood. Min Shin Pei, it's always good of you to join us on TVO. We thank you very much for your time, and we appreciate you being there for us from Claremont, California. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.